Ready? Uh, one second. I'll put my hand up. Okay. Hmm? Ready? Ready? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, to our internet viewers as well, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, now, in today's uh, lecture, let me begin first by praising Allah Azza wa Jalla. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salawatullahi wa salamuhu ala khatamin nabiyyin wa ala alihi tayyibin al-tahirin wa ala aswajihi umahatil mu'minin wa ala ashabihi ajma'in wa ala ta'bi'ayna wa man ta'bi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin wa alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. So brothers and sisters, uh, today uh, we are looking at uh, the Quran's message uh, to the world and uh, specifically now we want to deal with uh, Isa alayhi salam and the way he is presented in the Quran. Isa is known in, uh, to our English uh, speaking audience as Jesus and Isa in Arabic. His uh, Quranic name is Isa. He is mentioned by name in the Quran 25 times and uh, by contrast the name Muhammad occurs uh, وسلم, in the Quran only four times. And, and one more time, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is referred to as Ahmed. And, and so five times altogether you can say that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is referred to by name. But Isa is referred to by name in the Quran 25 times. Now that by itself is not a complete indication of relative value because obviously the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is uh, very important for the Quran and, and all of the Quran is revealed to him and within his life and uh, in some way is about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him as well. Uh, but uh, in the case of Isa alayhi salam, the fact that he's mentioned so many times in the Quran by name uh, gives you some idea that uh, the Quran has a lot to say about Isa alayhi salam. As compared with uh, other prophets. I'll just make sure that my phone is on silent uh, so that we are not interrupted inshallah. And there it is now on silent. So, uh, Isa alayhi salam is spoken of in the Quran in very honorable terms and this is remarkable because uh, outside of Christianity there is no other uh, world religion that uh, regards Isa alayhi salam with uh, such great respect. Some people may know of Isa alayhi salam cursorily and they may say something good about him. For example, uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, uh, in, uh, though being a Hindu, has said something favorable about Isa alayhi salam, but that's a modern, a fairly modern scholar. Um, so modern uh, scholars generally uh, think uh, broadly about the world's religions and they have an embracing and tolerant attitude uh, towards uh, many of the world's religions, well the world's religions in general, and they may say something favorable or about our Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, about Jesus, about Buddha, uh, about uh, Moses and so on. Uh, so uh, that itself is not a good indication of uh, how the world's religions view Isa alayhi salam. Uh, to, to see how the world's religions view Isa alayhi salam, we have to go to the original sources of those religions and the early development in the classical period. And we see that the major religions actually have nothing to say about Isa alayhi salam except for Judaism. Uh, Judaism, in some of its uh, commentary material in the Talmud, uh, makes reference to Isa alayhi salam. Uh, but the references they make to him uh, are not uh, very uh, charitable. Uh, there are references to him as a magician, as a, a sorcerer, uh, and somebody who was misleading people. So the Talmud says that uh, for, the, for the fact that he was misleading people, uh, he was charged with uh, blasphemy and he was put to death. 
so uh, that seems to acknowledge and yeah that he was put to death and that's fine this is the judgment of the Talmud against Isa alayhi salam and many modern Jews may regard Isa alayhi salam as uh, a good person as uh, a, a good man a teacher of religion and they will not have anything against him but uh, this is the classical religion whereas when we come to Islam now we see that the classical religion of Islam holds Isa alayhi salam in high regard in fact the most sacred document of Islam is the Quran uh, which Muslims believe to be a revelation from the Almighty God and that document uh, insists on belief in Isa alayhi salam so a Muslim cannot be a Muslim without believing in Isa, in Isa alayhi salam uh, if a Muslim says I be reject belief in Isa alayhi salam that Muslim will be rejecting the Quran and this is uh, unthinkable so uh, it is interesting then that uh, Islam shares with Christianity this high regard for Isa alayhi salam uh, as uh, the Quran itself, our sacred scripture, uh, does hold him in such high regard. So what does the Quran say about him? Uh, many uh, things that Christians believe in about Isa alayhi salam are affirmed in the Quran. Uh, the Quran, surprisingly, speaks about Isa alayhi salam being born in a, a special way, uh, that uh, the Quran indicates that Isa alayhi salam performed many miracles including healing the blind, curing the leper um, and uh, even raising the dead back to life and uh, f finally the Quran shows that Isa alayhi salam was raised up uh, to heaven and uh, many Muslims believe uh, 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 based on one interpretation of a verse in the Quran that Isa alayhi salam will uh, return uh, before the, the end of time. So these are beliefs that Muslims share with our Christian friends. The title Messiah is very important to many Christians. They think that this is a distinctive title uh, of Jesus salam, and uh, the Quran affords him the same uh, title because in Surah uh, Ali Imran uh, the Quran refers to him as al masih Isa ibn Maryam, the, the Messiah, Jesus son of Mary. Now our Christian friends uh, take this title to, uh, uh, sometimes they think this title and this must be at the common level because the scholars know it can't be so but some common Christians uh, think that the title Messiah must mean somehow that he is God but this ha is, is a mistake that's not what the title means uh, but the common uh, Christian may have simply worked it out uh, and, and draw a conclusion in this way thinking Jesus is God Jesus has a title Messiah we don't know of anyone else having the title Messiah therefore Messiah when we say Messiah we mean God uh, but the title itself Messiah doesn't mean God and in fact it refers to other people in the Bible itself in the Bible in the book of Isaiah in chapter 45 uh, a certain man Cyrus by name uh, a Persian king is called God's Messiah so what does Messiah mean then? More than one person can be called Messiah. Even a thing can be called Messiah. Uh, if God has consecrated that thing, if that thing is consecrated for God, a thing is declared to be holy or sacred in the religious tradition. That thing is called Messiah. Uh, it means simply anointed. And uh, it was the practice of uh, the Jewish people that they appointed uh, individuals for office uh, by... Uh, uh, well, uh, as a sign of their inauguration into office, uh, their heads will be anointed with oil. And hence the term anointed. So the anointed one was regarded with respect and thought to be under God's blessings as well. He was consecrated for office. So likewise, a, a rock might be consecrated as a, as a sacred rock. Oil might be poured upon it and that would be called an anointed rock. So it doesn't mean that only Isa alayhi salam is called Messiah. Or, well, this proves that not only Isa alayhi salam is called Messiah, and it also indicates that uh, Messiah is not a, a title of divinity. It's not God that is called Messiah. Uh, it is someone else who is uh, regarded to be say, to be holy in the sight of God that is called. Messiah or something else, even not even a person, someone or something else called Messiah. So Isa alayhi salam in that sense then is called Messiah in the sense that he is uh, consecrated for office. He is appointed to serve God. Uh, in Arabic we may say that somebody is Mustafa. He is selected, chosen by God for some special function. Isa alayhi salam is 
in that case, like a Mustafa, a selected one, and he is called by that Hebrew title Hamashiach, which means the anointed one. Now, what about Jesus' divinity? Uh, some point to his uh, virginal conception and say, well, that must mean that he is divine. The Quran, of course, does not uh, accept that Isa alayhi salam was God. At the same time, however, the Quran has a story about the birth of Isa alayhi salam that is similar to the story that is found in the Christian Gospels, especially the Gospel according to Luke. There in Luke's Gospel, it is mentioned that uh, the angel came and addressed Mary, saying, Hail Mary. And... Uh, uh, then uh, let her know that the, uh, she is going to have a child and she is surprised. How can she have a child? And then she is told that the power of the Most High will overshadow you uh, such that that which will be born in you will be called the Son of the Holy Spirit. Well, in a, in a similar way, but with some important differences, the Quran has it that uh, when uh, the angel came and addressed Mary and said to her, uh, God has chosen you and blessed you and uh, chosen you above the women of uh, all the world. Uh, oh Mary, uh, you should be devout towards uh, your Lord and you should prostrate and bow along with those who perform these uh, acts of worship before God. And then it, when she's told in Allah you bashiruki bi kalimatim min husmuhul masiha isa ibn Maryam wajihan fid dunya wal akhirah wa min al muqarrabin. She's told that Allah has given you a, a, the, the glad tiding uh, of uh, a, uh, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, who is going to be born through you. He will be wajihan fid dunya wal akhirah. He will be blessed in, the, in this world and in the life hereafter. Wa min al muqarrabin. And uh, he will be uh, from among those who are close uh, to God. He will speak to people uh, in the cradle and also in uh, the, when he is grown up. And he will be one of the righteous uh, persons. So she says, How can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And then she's told, When God decrees a thing, he only says to it be and it becomes. So that's within the domain and prerogative of God. He can make things happen in many and miraculous ways. Uh, so he has the power to bring a person into existence in any variety of circumstances. And here, uh, it's God's uh, command that finally makes this happen. And so she, according to the Quran, she uh, affirmed uh, the message that she received from God. The Bible also says that she said, I am a handmaid of the Lord, let it be to me as God pleases. And so, so she goes along uh, with what is going to happen. And the Quran shows that uh, she had a sort of normal uh, birth uh, she, in delivering her child because the Quran shows that the pain of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree and she said ya laytani uh, to qabla hadha. Uh, I, I wish I had died before this wa kuntu mansiya, and I wish I had just become something that is uh, forgotten and then a voice called out to her from below her saying to her la uh, tahzani do not uh, uh, grieve. Uh, God has placed uh, under you a, a rivulet. Uh, so you should eat and, and drink and, uh, and, and uh, uh, cool your eyes. And at the same time, and uh, shake the trunk of the palm tree, and uh, and the, the ripe dates will, will fall onto you. Uh, so then you can eat and, and drink and nourish yourself and cool your eyes. And uh, of course, uh, some uh, commentators say that the dates would have been easy, good for her now to replenish the blood sugars, uh, seeing that she had just uh, given uh, birth to a, a child. So when all this is done, 
and she is returning now to her to her people. She's carrying the child. Tahmilu, call you, call you. They say, Ya Maryamu, laqad jitif shay'an fariya. You have come with something uh, like unthinkable. Ya Ukta Harun, O sister of Aaron. Ma kana bukim ra'a sawi'in wa ma kanat ummuki baghiya. Your father was not uh, an evil man and your mother was not uh, a loose woman. So they want to know what, what is the explanation about this child. And uh, she pointed towards the child. And uh, the child said, Inni Abdullah. I am the servant of Allah. Atani al kitaba wa ja'alani nabiya. God has given me the book and made me a prophet. Wa ja'alani mubarakan aina ma kunt. And he has made me blessed wherever I shall be. Wa awsani bi salati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya. And he has enjoined upon me the uh, salat and zakat, uh, prayer and charity, uh, as long as I shall live. And then he continues to say that uh, I, uh, he has made me kind towards my mother, my, towards my mother, and he has not made me jabbar and shakiya. He has not made me arrogant and unblessed. Now, when we read this whole narrative, we see that uh, the Quran. It has much in common with the Christian Gospels, but at the same time there are important departures in the Quranic narrative about Jesus, and I will comment upon some of these issues. One issue is that the way in which the story is told in the, in the Gospels, one gets the impression as if God comes upon Mary in a way like a husband comes uh, to his wife. And uh, obviously that's not what is meant, but one just gets that, like the imagery is like this, that formulates in one's mind. And obviously God is far from, from this. Uh, in, in many ancient mythologies, gods mated with uh, women on earth and such were, were born. The Hebrews of old, but that's not the Quranic picture. The Quranic picture is that God is uh, transcendent and he just gives the word, he makes the command, and when he commands, Isa salam comes into being in the womb of his mother. So God does that. Uh, elsewhere in the Quran, in the same chapter uh, actually, in the seventh, uh, in, in the, the early verses, before the seventh, uh, it, it, it says, uh, He is the one who shapes you in the wombs of your mothers as he wishes. So obviously Isa salam, uh, like the rest of us, is shaped in the womb of his mother and somebody had to be there to shape him and that was God that was shaping him as God shapes all human beings and God creates then uh, Isa alayhi salam. So now many of our Christian friends may think that uh, because Isa alayhi salam is born in this special way that must mean that he is divine. Some Christians it is reported in some of the Sira works came to the Prophet peace be upon him from Najran and uh, they were disputing with him and saying to him well if Jesus doesn't have a father well God must be his father and uh, the Quranic answer is that uh, God is not father he is creator and he is the one who creates you even in the wombs of your mothers and uh, Isa Salam obviously by all counts was born of a woman so the question arises who shaped him in the womb of his mother who supervised his development and growth uh, from one stage to another in the belly of his mom uh, this was actually God that was doing that and so the Quran is showing us that Isa Salam was uh, created by God and though created in a special way and though uh, regarded very highly in the Quran uh, is not afforded the title of divinity of Godhead because that title uh, is deserved only by God, the one creator, the unseen fashioner of the heavens and uh, the earth. Another uh, important uh, departure from the gospel story uh, is that in the Quran you notice that it is said specifically that uh, God has made Jesus uh, blessed uh, and, and he has made Jesus uh, obedient to his mother and, and not uh, Jabbar and, and Shaqi, not uh, uh, overwhelming or you know um, overpowering uh, and, and unblessed. Uh, especially in relation to his mother. Well, it is interesting that in the Gospels, uh, uh, on occasion, it is noted that uh, Mariam comes to take Jesus home, uh, and that is the mother of Jesus, comes to take Jesus home, and uh, Jesus says to her, uh, 
Woman, what have I, what have I to do with you, thee? What, what do I have to do with you? It's like, you know, you're nobody to me. And, and addresses her in this way, woman, uh, without the normal respect that one might use in addressing one's uh, mother. Uh, now, why, uh, uh, why, why would Isa a.s. address his mother like this? The, the Bible uh, shows that one has to honor one's parents, one fa father and mother. That's uh, one of the commandments, one of the fourth of the Ten Commandments, which are thought to be the most important commandments in the Bible, because that is what God had written for most Moses on two stone tablets. So how could Jesus be disobeying one of the commandments? She is, after all, his mother. But what you can see here are two things happening. Uh, one is that uh, over time, as the stories about Jesus were being told and retold, people were puzzled over this question. How can you regard uh, Jesus as God and yet he has a human mother? So this was the problem for some people. So one answer to that is to try and distance Jesus from his mother. So by him referring to her in this way, woman, what have I to do with thee? It's as if this is divinity speaking and Mary has nothing to do with him, this God that is this man. So, so that's how the story got, get, uh, got evolved over time. Uh, so in the direction of trying to make Jesus into a, a, a divine being. It's getting there, it's not quite there, but these are tendencies uh, that, uh, that, that are, uh, are at play in, in the way in which the story is being shaped and reshaped, reshaped before it finally comes to be written down in the Gospels. The other tendency at work here is that soon after Isa alayhi salam, uh, a, when Isa alayhi salam, according to the Quran, was taken up by God, uh, soon after that, uh, we have an important teacher uh, of Christianity, a man by the name of St. Paul, who became very influential in Christianity. And in fact, Christianity largely has followed his teachings. So Christianity today may largely be referred to as Pauline Christianity. For more on this, one can read the book by the same title, Pauline uh, Christianity by John Zeisler. Uh, and many other scholars have written books uh, about Paul himself and about his influence on Christianity. Well now, a question arises. Who would understand Jesus better? His original disciples or somebody later who came and had not met Jesus on whom be peace? Naturally, his original disciples would understand him better. And it so happens that Paul uh, and the original disciples of Jesus were not on the same page regarding Jesus. Paul understood him one way, the original disciples of Jesus understood him uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, to the extent that Paul would be saying that some others have a false Christ. Of course, the others may say that it is Paul who has the false Christ. Because two different views. But the history is written by the winners, and in this case, Paul is the winner. The original disciples of Jesus were preaching that uh, people should follow the ancient Jewish law, and uh, that many people in the Greek or Roman environment found to be difficult. And so they rallied more towards the, the preaching of Paul, uh, who was suggesting that people did not have to follow the law. When it came to circumcision, for example, people did not have to circumcise their male uh, children. And of course, males who wanted to follow uh, the religion of Jesus uh, did not uh, now, according to Paul, did not need to be circumcised. Whereas uh, the Jewish call was that if you wanted to become a God-fearer, uh, then you needed to be uh, circumcised to start to associate with the Jewish community. So then, uh, Paul easily gained more followers with his uh, ideas and, and, and his preachings about Jesus. So when Christianity became Pauline Christianity, when it followed the direction of Paul away from the original disciples of Jesus on whom be peace, this presented a, a question. How do you know that this is the authentic religion? If Paul is calling for one thing and the original disciples of Jesus are calling for something else, which one do you follow? How do you know which is the right faith? Now, with the original disciples of Jesus, we can expand that to say, now what about the family of Jesus? What about Jesus' brothers? And what about his mother? Surely they know what Jesus was preaching. 
So why don't we follow them? And as it turns out, it looks like in Christian history, the split was between Paul on the one hand and all of the Jewish Christians on the other hand, including the family of Jesus, including his mother and his brothers. So now, how do you support Paul if you're a follower of Paul, if you're a follower of Paul? You have to say, well, the original disciples and the family of Jesus actually were either not good believers or they did not quite know or understand what Jesus was about. So in this case, we, we understand why. It's, it's said in the Gospels that during the days when Jesus was uh, uh, thinking about going up to Jerusalem, his brothers did not yet believe in him. So they did not be believe in him yet. So the br brothers were not believers. So that's one answer. Now, it is a fact and it comes to be known that later on, the, believe the, the brothers of Jesus, and in particular James, uh, is, uh, is a very important leader in the church among the early Christians. So that's not deniable. So what this story goes to show then is that James uh, was not a believer at the time when Jesus was preaching. There was at one time when James himself disbelieved in Jesus. So that casts a sort of doubt and suspicion about him, a sort of distance. Christians can, you know, um, excuse themselves if they, if they don't have that utmost respect for James and if they have greater respect for, for Paul. Uh, the, the mother of Jesus, the mother of Jesus, it is said now, came to Jesus he, and wanted to take him away. Why? Because uh, according to the gospel story, uh, the mother and his brothers, they came to take him away. They thought that he was beside himself. Beside himself. What, what is meant by beside himself? That's a way of saying that they thought he was mad. That he had some kind of evil spirit on him. This is how they spoke about a person being be, be, uh, beside himself. That's what they meant. So now, let us retrace our steps here and think more carefully. Imagine the story from the beginning. Maryam salam is visited by the angel. She gets this good news that she's going to have a son. She says, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? She's given the good news by the angel. God is going to make this possible. Now she has this child. Uh, now, is she going to think that this child is demon-possessed after she has had this message, communication with the angels? Why would she think that this child is demon-possessed out of his, his mind, beside himself? She wouldn't think that. But why does the gospel uh, represent her as thinking that? Because there is this clash between the two streams. The stream headed by Paul, the stream headed by the family and early disciples of Jesus. Those who chose Paul, they want to denigrate, they want to put down, debase, uh, the original followers of Jesus and his mother and brothers. The original disciples of Jesus in the gospel stories often come across as uh, not being very clever. Uh, they do not understand Jesus. Uh, Jesus might just be, have explained something and still they don't get it. And on occasion it looks like they don't even have faith. They don't believe well enough. So that Jesus will say to them, Oh you of little faith. Oh you of little faith. So he will keep addressing them like this because according to this uh, narrative, they don't really believe much. They're not very good believers, at least at that early stage. But despite all of this, there are some undeniable facts. One fact, as I've said, is that James later on becomes a leader, the leader of the Christian uh, group in Jerusalem, and he could not have just simply risen to that position from out of nowhere, like from not disbeliever to suddenly he's a believer. It means that he was a believer for some time uh, in coming, for some time uh, before that. And in fact, a, a conservative Christian a scholar by the name of Richard Baucom has acknowledged that uh, the brothers of Jesus may have believed in him actually before Isa a.s. was taken up into, into heaven. So that is an important, uh, it's an important admission. Uh, 
uh, because it means that the disciples of Jesus uh, included his uh, brothers, not just simply outsiders that he called uh, to that special uh, office. And it would mean that they have a, a great claim uh, to having understood and passed on the correct message and teaching about Jesus alayhi salam. Another important uh, fact that is undeniable is that Peter, one of the uh, who are said to be 12 disciples chosen by Jesus, was specifically appointed by, by, well, he was known to be a head, this is the undeniable fact, that he was known to be a head uh, of the early Christian movement after Isa alayhi salam was taken up into heaven. So since he was known to be a head of the Christian movement, how, how could it be understood that the Christians chose for their head somebody who is not competent, who wasn't a good believer, who didn't really understand Jesus? So this is known that he was a competent head and he was there. Now, uh, P Peter was in a clash with Paul. And we know of this from Paul's own writing. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians that there was this great confrontation with Peter over a question of law whether they, they can uh, sit at the same table with people who are eating non-kosher foods. And Peter withdrew from the table. And Paul says that that's when I opposed Peter to his face. Now we have to see the situation here. Here we have an original disciple of Jesus. In Muslim terms, this is like a Sahabi. One who lived and walked with the Prophet. Now, in Muslim terms, right? This is like a Sahabi. Now, on the other hand, we have Paul, who was not an original disciple. So, in Muslim terms, this would be like a Tabi'i. So, the Tabi'i is opposing the Sahabi. <laughs> is that, is that uh, doable? No. The, the Tabi'i has to learn from the Sahabi, right? So, in this case, we expect that Paul has to learn from Peter, but no, Paul is claiming his own authority, that God revealed his son to him, to, to Paul. And now, uh, Paul claims uh, that he has a special revelation from Jesus on whom be peace, and based on that he is teaching. He says, I did not learn uh, what I know from any man, meaning that he got it directly from uh, Jesus. So, what cannot be denied then is that uh, Peter is an important leader in the early church, and that makes it look like Paul is the odd one out. So sir, tra traditions survive. And one tr surviving tradition is that not only was Peter uh, in fact the head of the early church in Jerusalem, but that he was also specifically appointed by Jesus. So, so the tradition says that Jesus, on whom be peace, on one occasion had said to Peter, Peter, you are the rock. And that's how he gets the name Peter. Have you ever heard the, the word petrified in English? Petrified? Petrified means like becoming eh? stone. stone cold. Like very, if a person is frightened, you say the person has become like petrified. So, like, so terrified that the person has become stiff. That's like a stone. That's petrified becomes stone-like. So Petros in Greek means rock. Petros. And that's how Peter gets his name. That's when uh, Jesus says to him, you are Peter. You are a rock. And he says, on this rock I will build my church. So that means the Jama'ah of Christians called here church. Church is not necessarily a church building, but the Jama'ah like the Ummah. It's called a church of Christians. So Jesus, according to that statement, is saying to Peter, you are Petros, you are rock. And on this rock, I am going to build my church. His name was Simon. But uh, Jesus renamed him Rock. In Greek, Petros. And we call him now Peter in English. And said to him, on this rock I'm going to build my church. So that means that he becomes now the foundation of the church. If this saying of Jesus is authentic, and is there in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16 at the end. So uh, if this saying is authentic, then Peter has full authority to teach the religion of Isa alayhi salam. And if Paul says now, I oppose Peter to his face, 
Who should be followed? Peter or Paul? Obviously Peter. Uh, but the church went the way of Paul. They have followed Paul. And because they followed Paul, they represent Peter many times in the Gospels and other disciples of Jesus in the Gospels as being uncomprehending, a little bit naive, uh, slow to understand what Jesus is talking about, uh, sometimes demanding uh, or, or desiring um, uh, things which are not from a faith perspective, like someone uh, says to Jesus, oh, uh, when you come back, uh, let us, uh, you know, let us be leaders with you. And, you know, something like this. Like they have some desires, not for heaven and the afterlife, but things of this world. So this is how they are being represented in this way. The mother of Jesus, on whom be peace, is also, uh, in a way, being misrepresented because people who followed Paul, they have a great challenge to overcome. How do they follow a man who is teaching something different from what the original disciples and... Uh, and the family of Jesus on whom be peace was teaching. So this is why we find that in the gospel story, Jesus addresses his mother as woman and says to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Woman, what, what, what's between you and me? Like, what's, what, as if they have no relationship between them. And uh, this comes across as being disrespectful. But in the Quran, how does that come across? The Quran has it that Isa alayhi salam uh, is very dutiful and respectful towards his mother. And that of course is in line with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, which the fourth of which says, uh, the fifth rather, the fifth says, honor uh, thy father and thy mother. The Quran of course uh, enjoins respect for one's parents and especially for one's uh, mother, uh, even more so than, than one's father. And so it is expected by Muslims that Jesus, a great moral uh, uh, teacher, uh, would have uh, put into practice something like the Ten Commandments and he would have honored uh, his uh, mother. So the Quran gives a different uh, take on the story and shows that he was dutiful to his mother. In this way, when we read the Quran, it is important to also know what came before the Quran. The Mufassirun often knew this because they got the information from people who knew uh, the previous scriptures and they used that information to explain further what the Quran is speaking about. We are also, for, uh, uh, for our part, need to go deeper now, go even beyond where the commentators went because the commentators went to a certain extent. We, in each generation we should be taking the knowledge uh, further and further. So we need to go further and uh, investigate even more. And in this uh, manner we can see that the Quran has a very subtle difference here with the gospel material in representing Jesus in, in this way. Um, so I, I see that the sister has come in here with, uh, sister you have some food to be supplied, is that correct? Is that what you have? Uh, can, can somebody help the sister who is familiar with the way things go here? Shukran. Now, uh, so uh, this uh, is a good point at which uh, I, can, um, uh, I can pause and take your questions. Any questions that you have regarding Isa uh, rem Remember that the, the reason we are discussing this topic is we are talking about the Quran's message for the world. And uh, many of the people we are interacting with are people of Christian backgrounds. They may not be very staunch Christians, but they may know something about Christian history, about the central Christian beliefs, and they may know about Isa salam and they may wonder, what does your religion say about Isa alayhi salam? And we started out by saying that the Quran has a lot of things to say about Isa alayhi salam, never criticizing him, always holding him in high regard and, and deep respect, uh, at the same time in uh, maintaining that he was a servant and messenger of God. So, uh, any questions about anything like this? Yes, Sadhu Mushak. Isa alayhi salam is whole life married or single? Aha, uh -huh. okay, interesting question. So the question was Isa alayhi salam married or did he remain single throughout his life? Uh, from the Islamic traditions we have nothing that says that he was married. Uh, and interestingly in the case of John the Baptist, Yahya, it says uh, that he was Hasur. And Hasur may mean that he was not married. Uh, that seems to be the obvious meaning. Some of the commentators say that. Hasur. That's in the case of Yahya alayhi salam. But in the case of Isa alayhi salam it is not stated whether he was Hasur or not, whether he remained single single or not. But no wife is mentioned about him anywhere in, in the Quran or in, in Islamic traditions as far as I, I know. 
And in the Gospels, uh, also no wife is mentioned of him, although he, he seems to have many followers, many of whom are women, women who traveled with him. And the women are identified, this is the wife of that man, this is the wife of that man, and so on. Uh, and he, it's mentioned that he has sisters, but uh, never in the Gospels does it say that he has a wife. Now Peter, we mentioned previously, uh, Peter, one of his uh, followers, it, it, it's related that he had a mother-in-law, which implies that he had a wife, because you don't get a mother-in-law unless you first have a wife, right? Uh, so uh, Peter uh, was married, but, but it's never stated that Isa was, was married. Now in one of the letters of Paul, Paul is calling on people to remain uh, unmarried. And he says, I, I wish that people will remain as I am, meaning that Paul is unmarried. But he doesn't say uh, like Jesus, like Jesus was unmarried. So now that leaves some ambiguity. Is it known that Jesus was, was married or not? It is not clear. Uh, some people want to come up with some modern theories to say that Jesus was married, uh, but uh, none of those uh, theories so far has uh, reached with widespread acceptance. Some of the theories are actually very far-fetched. Like in the book The Da Vinci Code, it is mentioned that Isa went, uh, was married and he, went with, he was married to Mary Magdalene and then he went to France and there they left some progeny, some children, and, and, and then there is a search for finding the descendants of Isa Islam who still apparently survive and something like this. But these are like fantastic stories. Uh, uh, scholars do not give much credence to these stories. What I find to be uh, uh, having some credence is a book written by Anthony Ladon. Anthony Ladon, he is a scholar and he's written in, a, in an academic style giving facts and figures, uh, a, a book entitled uh, The Wife of Jesus. And uh, in that book, he's not claiming definitively that, that Jesus was married and he's not claiming uh, that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Uh, which many of the legends uh, try to uh, try to say, but uh, uh, this scholar argues that Isa salam, when he emerges on the scene as a preacher uh, uh, in the Gospels, he is 30 years old. And prior to that, the only thing we know about him was up to when he was 12 years old. So the Gospels mention he was 12 years old and something happened. And then nothing more, and now he's 30 years old, and he comes on the scene and he starts to preach. So what happened from the time he was 12 years old to the time he became 30 years old? That's an 18 year gap. Now, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, for all historians know, uh, was a, a within that Jewish tradition. So what did the Jewish tradition recommend in terms of marriage? In terms of marriage, people would have gotten, especially boys, boys would have gotten married in their late teens or in their early 20s. This is general and very common. In fact, uh, they thought that people should get married. And uh, Anthony Ladon argues that would, there would have been strong societal pressures for Jesus to get married at that time. So the presumption should be that he was married. Then the question becomes, what about his wife? Why do we not hear about a wife? Anywhere. And uh, the answer to that from Anthony Ladon is that actually in those days, uh, women very often uh, uh, died in childbirth. Because it's not like today, you know, you go to a modern hospital, you have all kinds of uh, equipment uh, and, and uh, intravenous and so on uh, to take care of women in childbirth. Uh, in, in those days, you did not have any of these and, and women often died in childbirth. So, according to this scholar, it is possible that Isa a.s. was married and maybe, if he was married, maybe his wife died in childbirth and that's why we do not hear anything more about uh, his wife. When he emerges on the scene, when he is 30 years old, at this time he is truly single, there is no wife because he might have been married previously and if so the, the wife may have died. And God knows best. This is not definitive but it is uh, some kind of speculation but a scholarly one and that is a respectful uh, and respectable attempt at thinking about uh, this aspect of, of Jesus. So in conclusion nothing in the Islamic tradition sh saying that he was married and nothing denying it either. Uh, so it's, it's neutral. Uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, there is a strong tradition there, thinking that he was not married, 
This is from many hundreds of years. They have thought about Jesus as being single. Uh, but uh, there too, if one um, uh, thinks about the situation of Isa Alayhi Salam, especially in the missing years, one has no guarantee that he was not married during those missing years. And according to Anthony Ladon, uh, it, it's very possible that he was married because that would have been the normal situation. If somebody was not married, that would have been like unusual. The usual thing is that you meet a man, he's 30 years old, he's a Jewish young man, the presumption is that he was married. Okay, so why no wife is mentioned? Maybe he was married and his wife died in childbirth, we don't know, uh, but the presumption is that he was married is, is a valid presumption. Uh, because of the social milieu in which Jesus lived. That's what's normal for that, that person. It's like asking, you know, did, did, he do, did he wear clothes? Well, it was normal for people to wear clothes, so it's not even a question. Did he marry? Well, yeah, it was normal for people to get married. It's not even a question. Whereas his wife, we don't know. Maybe his wife died in childbirth. Uh, so uh, Allah knows best the answer to this question, whether he was married or not. If he was married, uh, that, of course, is no problem for Muslim belief, right? If he was married... Uh, because prophets generally got married and uh, uh, the Quran actually talks about prophets in the past and said that you know uh, all the prophets they usually had uh, wives and children so if Isa a.s. was not married he would be an exception and uh, the general situation with prophets according to the Quran is that they had azwajam wa dhuriya they had wives and and children uh, now if he was married this poses a question for Christian belief it now becomes complicated because uh, Christians who think of Isa as God will have to now think about his wife and what status she would have in relation to divinity. So that, that's an interesting question to, for, for our Christian friends to weigh in on. Okay, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Any questions from our internet audience? Uh, we have one question. In Paul's uh, in 4.13 describes uh, specifically Peter and John as idiots, unlettered, and uneducated. What is your view? Okay, what was the reference 413 of which book? Yeah, of 13 of Paul's scribe. Of Paul's? Scribe. Mm. Okay, uh, f uh, okay, so Paul, uh, ma many letters are credited to Paul, and the question is this uh, in, in Paul's writings, uh, he uh, refers to the original disciples of Jesus. Did he name them, John and? Peter and John. Peter and John, as? Uh, idiots, unlettered, and uneducated. Yeah, he, he, not very flattering remarks he makes about, about the followers of Jesus, Peter and John, uh, and, and another one. Uh, so, um, how do we re then regard Paul in this case? The reference given is 413, but I'm not familiar, but we'd have to know which particular letter. But in, in any case, it is clear that in the letter to the Galatians, uh, Paul does speak uh, about the disciples of Jesus in this way and he names them as Peter, James and John and uh, in fact uh, elsewhere he speaks very disparagingly about some early Christians and some historians think that Paul was referring to the original disciples of Jesus even there but in some places it is clear he's referring to them by name and he's saying that they're, uh, what they were means nothing to me even if they had some great reputation at one time uh, so he's saying I am my own man I'm teaching and I have authority to teach directly from Jesus and what they what uh, what uh, respect they have among people the reputation they have that is of no uh, use to me uh, so how should we regard Paul then in that case well it's very clear from the talk that uh, the original disciples of Jesus were according to the Gospels they were handpicked by Jesus there is one who betrayed Jesus but the others we understand to remain faithful to him that's the presume that's the presumption in the Gospels in the Quran uh, the disciples of Isa <coughs> as re are regarded uh, with special reverence they are uh, referred to as al uh, they, they, and the Hawariyun, uh, they say that we believe, Amanna, uh, we believe in Allah, washhad bi anna muslimun, bear witness that we are muslimun, we are submitters to Allah azawajal. That's what the term muslimun means, we are submitters to Allah azawajal. We submit to Allah, we obey His commandment, we accept His uh, revelation. That's what is meant by Muslim, submitters. 
So uh, from the Quranic presentation, we understand the Hawariyun, uh, the disciples of Isa alayhi salam, to be his faithful followers. And uh, we do not uh, expect uh, uh, that anyone would disparage them in this way. And if somebody does disparage them in this way, as uh, Paul does uh, in his writings, uh, then we have to say we are with the original disciples of Isa alayhi salam, and uh, we have uh, questions about this other individual who was teaching things contrary to the teachings of Isa alayhi salam and contrary to the teachings of the original disciples and followers of Isa alayhi salam as well. Any other questions? Okay, and from the floor, yes, my brother. Yes, uh, I just a uh, point of curiosity, I want to, want to know your opinion. It seems that today um, the only people that follow uh, the Prophet Isa, which is Jesus, is the, the Muslim people, in the way of uh, praying, the Salah, in the, in the Bible, there's so many uh, places they say like uh, when he pray, he put his face down, touch the ground, right? But nowhere in the Christian world now they follow that posture. Hmm. Nobody. And then also the, the fasting. Uh, Jesus fasted 40 days in like, uh, continuously, but nobody now follow that. Only Muslim fast in the Ramadan in like a uh, whole month. But, but I don't know where they change. I ask Christian people and they still like us. They have no clue. I don't know why. But mm -hmm. it seems that the only Muslim is that uh, you want to follow like uh, Jesus to the, to the point. These are interesting observations, Brother Fee, yes. Uh, and, and so the, the brother is saying uh, that we, we notice that Muslims pray like Jesus prayed and we fast. And it is known that Isa alayhi salam fasted. So why is it that only uh, Muslims are following these things these days? And he asked some Christian friends, like, where along the way did things get changed? Why aren't Christians doing these anymore? And uh, Christians do not generally seem to know. So how do we make sense of this? So uh, as for the prayer, let me say that it is very clear in the Gospels that Isa alayhi salam prayed with his face to the ground just like Brother Fee said. In, in Matthew chapter 26 verse number 39 it says that Isa alayhi salam fell on his face and prayed. So what does that mean? He made, it means he made sujood and, and he was praying. To, to God. Uh, and, and our Christian friends, uh, we would expect to do the same thing because uh, the word Christian actually means imitator of Christ, one who copies, one who makes ittiba uh, of, of uh, Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and, and we make it tiba of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We follow him and by following him we are indirectly following all of the great prophets because he taught us the way that the great prophets uh, followed. So when we fall on, on the face, uh, uh, when we fall on the, uh, to the ground with our faces, uh, we are actually following not only our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but also Isa Alaihi Wasallam. So that makes us imitator uh, of Christ as well. Although indirectly, uh, but to those who say that they are imitators of Christ, they don't copy Christ in this way. So that's surprising, uh, and that calls for an explanation. And uh, as for fasting, yes, Brother Fee is correct. It is mentioned in the Gospels that Isa alayhi salam fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, and he was hungry as a result of that fasting. And it is mentioned that his disciples too uh, were fasting. Early Christians were fasting. It is known from, from the, uh, from the uh, Christian writings in the New Testament, in the Christian Bible. And it is also uh, mentioned that Isa alayhi salam said to his uh, disciples, uh, well, he was saying to, to people that, uh, you know, when, when the bridegroom is there, uh, the, 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 the guests do not fast. But when the bridegroom is gone, then the, the guests will fast. So that meant uh, probably that when he was there with his disciples, maybe he needed his disciples for missionary journeys, and so they should not fast at that time because they were always traveling and giving the message. Uh, as, uh, and we know when people are traveling, they have ruksa not to fast. So that could be the, the, the reason why the disciples were not fasting at the moment. But he spoke to the disciples and said, when you fast, uh, you should oil your hair and wash your face so that people would not have pity on you. Because you know sometimes you're fasting and you say, oh, I'm fasting so, so everybody can be sorry for you, right? So he's saying no, uh, oil your hair and uh, wash your face so you can look bright because you don't want people to be sorry for you. You're fasting for the sake of God. So when you fast, that means that you are going to fast, right? So somebody wrote a book actually uh, about fasting and, and said on the cover of the book that Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. 
He didn't say if you fast. If you fast, that means you have a choice to fast or not. Uh, maybe you will fast, maybe you won't. But he says when you fast, which means definitely you will fast. And, and that's what is expected of the followers of Isa as well. And in fact, some Christians do fast in some way in the period that is known as Lent, but it is not so widely and generally known and, and generally practiced. What is generally practiced is the fast of the Muslims, and uh, Muslims are known for prostrating on the floor. Maybe a Christian on occasion may prostrate, but it's not a general practice among uh, Christians. And uh, when we see that this is such a general practice among Muslims, we realize that Muslims Muslims are followers of all of the great prophets of God. So let us uh, break at this point because we've come close to the Maghrib time. We'll have to break and observe uh, the iftar. Uh, our viewers on the internet, thank you all for tuning in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, tomorrow, same time, 8 o'clock. And uh, also at 10 o'clock, we have another session. Uh, brothers and sisters, thank you for coming out and for listening to me. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our prayers, our fasting, and all of the good deeds we're doing for his sake. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I believe that something will be available for us to break fast with on the lower floor. So please, let's go break our fast and then we'll come back for the Maghrib prayer, inshallah. Uh, so the women will go from uh, go uh, in this direction. Brothers who are on this side of the wall, brother, my brother who's reading the Quran, if you can just leave that area, we'll, we'll mark it off for the sisters to travel there. And it'll be easier for them. Shukran. Mm -hmm. let, let me go. See. Yeah, please, that brother is setting up this tension, so that's good. Okay. Okay, brother, you can stretch. The, yeah, see if you can stretch those um, uh, the, the 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 belt across to reach. Inshallah. There should have been three. Uh, uh, where is one? Pull. Yeah. <laughs> 